Well, good morning and welcome to Palliative Care and Geriatric Grand Rounds. Welcome back to all those here at Dana-Farber, Care Dimensions, Cooley Dickinson, and a special welcome to those attending today from the Home Hospital Program. I'm B.R. Dobbin, the Course Director of Grand Rounds, and it's my privilege today to introduce our guest speaker. Dr. Leff is a professor of medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. His principal areas of research relate to innovative models of community-based care for older adults, quality of care, care of people with multiple chronic conditions, guideline development, and risk prediction. He has served on multiple technical expert panels for CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, NQF, National Quality Forum, and the NCQA, the National Committee for Quality Assurance. Dr. Leff cares for patients in the acute, ambulatory, and home settings. He's a member of the ABIM Council, Chair of the Geriatric Medicine Specialty Board, past President of the American Academy of Home Care Medicine, and past member of the Board of Regents of the American College of Physicians. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Leff today. So it's wonderful to be here at Man's Greatest Hospital, and, uh, and in this historic room, although I would tell you as someone who spent the first eight years of his life in the Bronx, it is a hard day to be in Boston. It is, it is really, it is damn hard. I gotta, I gotta tell you that. Um, and also, this is, I don't, this is a, these rooms that go up are really hard. So I'm gonna do my best to look up. If I don't, someone just warn me and uh, beat me up a little bit, and I'll try and uh, uh, and I'll try and manage that. But it really it really is lovely to be here uh, with good colleagues in, in Boston. And what I'd like to do today is uh, I'm going to start first with disclosures. Clinical advisor to several entities. Happy to answer questions about any of those if that would be helpful. And then I'm going to start with a headline the lesson, what I'd like you to walk away with, and then hopefully we'll come back to that at the end. And that lesson is that I have a strong belief that home-based medical care will get mainstreamed into the U.S. healthcare delivery system. I don't know what the lag on that is. I don't know if I will be alive <laughs> when that happens, uh, but it's something I've been working on uh, for a while, and I'd like to convince you of that. And what I'll do is I'm going to start with uh, describing my journey along this path, tell you why I'm passionate about this, how I got involved in this, uh, talk a bit about the spectrum of home-based medical care, which I hope would be helpful, especially for some of the trainees, maybe the faculty. It took me years to figure out what that thing really was. Then I'm going to talk about the homebound and what they are like. Then I'm going to talk, focus on two models of care specifically. One is home-based primary care, and we could also think of home-based primary care and home-based palliative care, and then finally talk about hospital at home, and then end off talking about some of the challenges in having these culturally antagonistic models get integrated into uh, U.S. healthcare. So um, I got interested in this when I was a, in a geriatrics fellow, uh, actually a general internal medicine resident at Hopkins. So in the second year of our three-year training program, the GIM residents would pick up as their additional clinic, you know, second to the dysfunctional hospital-based house staff clinic. <laughs> and I know you don't have that problem here, um, but we, we had some challenges and still have some challenges in Baltimore. But we all picked up a second clinic, and that clinic was a home-based primary care practice. Uh, so for folks who are living in um, Southeast Baltimore. By the way, are any of you, or were any of you fans of The Wire on HBO? Raise your hand. So that's like the best thing that's ever been on television. <laughs> and it's not just because it's a Baltimore thing, um, but it really is, it's a Dickens novel. Uh, and so the reason I bring it up is that uh, where our hospital is located, Hopkins Bayview, is where most of season two of The Wire was filmed and actually, you know, views outside my window were, were part of the set. Anyway, uh, I picked up this house calls practice, this home-based primary care practice, started to go out and make visits in southeast Baltimore. And that's where I think I really learned how to be a doctor, right? You go out, you really have to talk to patients, you really have to take a history, you really have to do a physical because it's not like the 
Echo and the Cath are sitting right next to the bed. I think I learned a lot about how to talk to patients and educate them. I know I learned a lot about coming up with reasonable and realistic differentials and management plans that could be implemented outside of the bricks and mortar. And I learned what it is to see people in their social milieu and see how important that was in their lives. And really got a great sense, you know, when you're a trainee in the hospital, you think the world is the hospital. And you know what, it ain't. It's really not. Hospitals are a blip in the lives, hopefully a blip in the lives of people. And you know, even using terms like admitted to the hospital, discharged to the community, I think you need to flip that. <laughs> people get discharged from the community to the hospital, you know, at some, at some level. In any event, it, it really made a strong impact on me and it really, it really stayed with me. Um, uh, before I get there, so I finished my fellowship. I actually did something crazy to follow my wife. She went to med school, we met at NYU, um, and she went to med school on an army scholarship. She got sent to Seoul, Korea after her training. I actually had to join the army so I could practice, and then came back to Hopkins and, and started working on, on hospital at home. And when I did that, I really started getting into the literature on home-based medical care. And you know what? It's a total freaking mess. It is a really messy literature that took me years to figure out the terms that people are using and what they actually meant by that. So I'm just going to spend a minute on that. And this is a mental, my mental map of home-based medical care that Liz Madigan and I put this together for an IOM workshop on the future of uh, home health care a few years back. So on the left side here, we have what I would call informal services. So we're at home, you and I are married, I'm starting to get demented, I need someone to give me a bath. Hopefully one of you will be kind enough to do that. I'm not going to pay you to do that, but you're going to do that for me, and the U.S. economy will reap some substantial cost savings from that. And there are probably about 10 or 15 million people who are doing that every day. If I don't have anyone who will do that for me, I can pay someone to do that. And that's what are called formal personal care services, right? And usually you have to buy these services in chunks of about four hours. It's anywhere between 25 and 50 bucks an hour. You never know who's coming into your home. Not easy to arrange for most people and not affordable for many. Then there's skilled home health care. How many of you have signed orders for skilled home health care? right? Remember, you have signed your, your life away. Federal regs, you are all on the line. You could be, you'll be going to jail long before anyone in the administration will be going to jail, right? And what happens here, the, these are services that are available to people who meet Medicare definitions of being homebound and have a skilled need. That is, they need a, nurse, a skilled person, a nurse, OT, PT, to do something for you. That care comes in 60-day episodes of care. It's paid to the provider, a home health agency, on a prospective basis through an incredibly complex formula. Makes DRGs look easy, right? Like 128 different payment categories, right? And if that doesn't incentivize gaming, I don't know what does. And for the most part, um, it's hard sometimes to find a correlation between provision of these services and avoiding the outcomes that we'd like, like to avoid. But about three and a half million people get these services each year. A lot of it in the, if you look at the Dartmouth map on this, a lot of it in the southeast. Moving a little bit more to the right, home-based primary care. Probably about half a million people getting this. I'll describe that model in more depth in a minute. But this is, this is that home-based primary care, longitudinal care in the home, and then moving over to the right, actually delivering hospital care in the home, in hospital at home. So as you move from left to right, you're going from low to high acuity. You're going from more of a chronic care construct towards an acute care construct. And you're moving from models with really little or no physician involvement to models with a lot of physician involvement. But this is actually being highly disrupted now and actually, I think of this disruption in a pretty positive sense. We, we need disruption uh, in medicine. So you have, home, you know, there's home-based primary care. More recently, you're seeing home-based palliative care models, which is fantastic. I think the way we put those models together is really important, how we join them with home-based primary care, 
uh, and geriatrics is really important, but that is a fantastic development. You all are very familiar with Boku models of transitional care and post-acute care that have been burgeoning over the years, in, in, uh, play an important role, effective, effectiveness probably highly variable depending on how they're put together. You're starting to see urgent care at home. So you can get on your phone and in certain places get a doctor on the phone so you don't have to go if you have a strep throat or if you want someone to come and give you your flu shot in the home. You can get that online now, right on your phone. A lot of development lately of EMS models, so pa community paramedics, which are an incredible resource because they actually can do a lot. They can do an EKG, they can give IV diuretics, you can summon them up at the toss of a coin. You can get that to happen now. You now have what I would call formal personal care services plus. So we talked about formal personal care services. You have to buy it for four hours at a time. It's hard to figure out who to provide it. You can now kind of do this in an Uber kind of way if you live in certain places. So in San Francisco, you could say, I would like a Mandarin speaking woman to come to my house tomorrow at noon for one hour and give me a bath. Now I might have to pay a surge price for that, but I can get that done in some places. Um, also, what I would call function-focused brief interventions. That's a bit obscure, but uh, there's a particular model I'm thinking about that was developed by a colleague of mine in which I'm a co-investigator. So the colleague is Sarah Zant, and she's from the School of Nursing at Hopkins, developed an intervention called CAPABLE. So it's a time-limited intervention of a nurse, OT, and handyman. Handyman, right. The handyman, oh, everyone always gushes at the handyman, right? So hand, handyman for people with functional impairment, ADL impairment living in the community. And when Sarah came to me with this, I said, it's not gonna work because nothing improves function, right? I've been jaded, gotten jaded over the years. Nothing improves function. This model improves function and saves Medicare and Medicaid money in, CMMI, in CMS demonstration projects and in NIH randomized control trials. Really impressive. The real special sauce there is Sarah's figured out a way to get this kind of care directed by patient elicited goals, right? Sounds easy. We think we do it all the time. We never do that. Not never, we rarely do that, right? So if someone says, my goal is to get out to the mailbox, you don't fix the steps to the basement that she's never gonna go on. You fix the stairs out front so she can get to the damn mailbox, right? And then there's a slew of telemedicine and sensor technology Lots of companies out there doing this stuff, uh, algorithms and the AI to be, the, to be determined and to be developed. Um, let me just shift now and tell you about the homebound. So these are data from the Nas uh, National Health and Aging Trends Study, NHATS. These are all public data. They're curated at Hopkins online. Anyone can download them and start to play with them. Uh, colleagues at UCSF and Sinai and at Hopkins try to figure out, use the data in that longitudinal study to figure out how many people out there are homebound. Because when you would look to the original references, it would always quote census data. And if you went to look it up, you could never actually find it. Um, so we use the, the questions in NHATS to try and make a determination as to the number of homebound in the US. So on the upper left, you see what we called completely homebound, people who never go out. They would, answering the question, have you been out in the last 30 days? Their answer was no. And these were not all people in Boston a few years back when you had that lovely winter, right? That this is a national sample. About 400,000 of those people in the US. And then we have people who we call mostly homebound. These are people who rarely go out, about another 1.6 million. And then you have people who go out some days, well, actually I have the mouse here who go out some days, most days, or every day. But it's interesting, within each of those large boxes, you still have people who never go out by themselves, need help, or still have difficulty. And when you start to put all these people together, you come up close to six million people who are completely, mostly, or functionally homebound. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. And these people are different from all of us here, right? So people who are homebound, 
you know, have lower educational attainment, less likely to be married with a partner, much more likely to be economically challenged, much more likely to have low rated self-reported health, more likely to be depressed, less likely to be able to walk a half a block or so, and much more likely to be hospitalized. So these are people who need our help. They need the help of the health and they need the help of the social system, right? So coming back to our mental map, I'm gonna talk now for a few minutes about uh, home-based primary care. So this is, this is a photo of uh, a dear friend and colleague, Eric DeYoung. Eric was a, a former fellow. He's the current president of the American Academy of Home Care Medicine. And about 20 years ago, Eric decided to test the hypothesis that it would be better to be from Hopkins than at Hopkins. So he left, he left Hopkins, and he went down uh, about 30 miles on I-95 and settled in DC and started a home-based primary care program at Washington Hospital Center. And uh, this is Eric at his best. His practice has really turned out to be very important, both in terms of helping the field establish some clinical standards and norms, and also been very important in health policy discussions uh, in terms of the independence at home demonstration, which I'll talk about in a minute, because his practice is close to the Capitol. He lobbies a lot, and then he brings folks and he takes them out on house calls. And if you've never been on a house call, go on one. It will, it can change your life. Um, so Eric, the home-based primary care practices, these are practices that provide continuous longitudinal care. Uh, and remember, these are people with chronic, multiple chronic conditions, functional impairment, limited social capital. Uh, they provide interdisciplinary care. And they know that if you only focus on the medical for these patients, you're done, you're over. It has to be medical and social. They choose their specialists carefully. They provide 24 seven access to someone who knows them on the phone. That is unbelievably critical. And other qualitative research that colleagues and I have done, that ability to talk to someone in the middle of the night who knows them and can tell them, go to the ED, or you know what, you don't need to and I'll come see you in the morning. Unbelievably, unbelievably important. These practices are not in the body part business. Right. These are holistic. They're really looking at people in a holistic way. And these are summary data from a systematic review on home-based primary care in older adults published a few years ago in JAGS. And what you see is a reduction in emergency department visits by about 15 percent, hospital admissions down by about 30 percent, hospital bed days of care go down by about 45 percent, Long-term care admissions and bed days of care, there was one VA study that looked at that, and lower costs. Um, satisfaction and caregiver quality of life is better. And the folks who wrote uh, this, met, this systematic review in looking at these programs, they drew an inference, it may be true, it may be not, that, these, that the critical elements that get to these outcomes are interdisciplinary teams that meet regularly, and that after, after hours support element. So why does that actually work? Why does home-based primary care work in that way? So, you know, as a health services researcher, where it took me years to learn this lesson, but the key thing is to be able to truly and very carefully line up the targeted population with the model that you have to get to an outcome. And it sounds easy, but where we tend to go wrong is that we're fuzzy on the outcome. Right, what outcome are you truly living to, truly willing to live or die for? And you have to prioritize those outcomes. If you don't do that, if you're not true to that, you're gonna mess up. And your model actually has to be able to get to those outcomes and it has to apply to that population. Do you, anyone know who the guy on the left is? He's a Boston guy. I, I can't even tell you how disappointed I am. This is Willie Sutton. So Willie Sutton was a famous bank robber in, these, in this area. He's not out there anymore, so don't worry. And he was successful for a while. He robbed a lot of banks. I don't know what's going on up here, security, but he robbed a lot of banks. He made a lot of money. One day, as will happen, he was caught. He was tried. He was walking, the story goes, he was walking out of the courtroom one day and some brilliant reporter asked him, Willie, why do you rob banks? And he turned around and looked at him like, are you kidding me? That's where the money is. 
<laughs> That's where the money is, right? If you want to save money, you can only save money on people who cost money, in whom there are preventable costs to be had, okay? If I am unfortunate and tomorrow I learn I have pancreatic cancer, which I'm hoping does not happen, I'm gonna have a very expensive year or two or three of healthcare if I live that long. Very little of that is preventable. Very little of it. This population has a lot of preventable costs. In fact, Anish Jha, I don't know which way the Harvard School of Public Health is, I'm gonna say it's that way. So has done, you know, that group has done some amazing work using claims and they published a study last year in Annals where they looked at the total Medicare claims experience. They found that about 5% or so of Medicare costs are preventable, okay? 4% of the medical care, Medicare population is frail. That 4% accounted for nearly 50% of the preventable cost. So when you guys go and you talk to the leadership at a place like Mass General or anywhere else, geriatrics and palliative medicine should be able to go to the table and say, guys, we are your solution. It's, it's, you, know, you can build the towers and do all sorts of wonderful things that people need, but we're the folks who really need to be at the table for population health discussions because we can actually do that, right? We are the ones who can do that. So off the soapbox. Um, let me just shift gears now towards hospital at home. So this is a gentleman named Walter. He was one of my uh, home-based primary care patients. He was managed in our home-based primary care program. <clears throat> and uh, Walter was a classic, classic guy from our neighborhood. He was a former Beth Steel worker, actually in our neighborhood during World War II, the largest steel mill on the planet Earth was right, you know, right near us. So our, our population is really an aging steel town. Um, and Walter was just that kind of guy, just down to earth, in your face. He'd call you stupid. It was very refreshing. And despite being managed in our home-based primary care program by thoughtful Hopkins geriatricians, Walter would end up in the hospital and he had a lot of gripes about his hospital care. He would say things like, I can't get my breathing treatments on time, so I end up on the ventilator. The food stinks. Actually, he was a bit more colorful, but we are in the historic setting, so I'm not going to sully it by giving you his actual language. He said no one would talk to me, so it was pretty lonely. Uh, he said I got confused and got tied down. So one time he developed incident delirium. He was physically restrained. He never forgot that. He brought that up at every single visit for the rest of his days about how dehumanizing that was. And then I know this doesn't happen in, in Boston or in your practice, but uh, only in Baltimore, Walter would always come home with a completely new set of medicines that we had no idea what to do with. Um, so one day we were out making a house call. Walter had a community-acquired pneumonia. His blood pressure was okay, but a little bit low for him. His O2 sat was about 90%. And we said, Walter, you need to go to the hospital. And I will not soon forget this. He said, he looked at us and he said, I had a student with me, I think. He said, listen, I am so sick and tired of you geniuses from Hopkins. I'm just so tired of you guys. You are great doctors. You run a crappy hotel. I am not going to the hospital. I'm done. I'm done. So we had, we had a number of experiences like this in our home-based primary care program. And we started to think, how can we turn this into a true program? And when I say the we, the real we in that sentence was John Burton, my, my former chief, who is still sort of working. And he's like, he just the most, the most amazing man, both personally and professionally, just, you know, a true hero. And Donna regan Strife, who is a senior program officer at the Hartford Foundation. John would talk about the house call program. We would talk about, we should do more hospital at home. And Donna said, okay, here's a grant, just shut up, do something. And basically the day I got out of the army and joined the faculty at Hopkins, that was handed to me. Okay, that was handed to me. Go, Bruce, go do this. Um, so I did, with a, lot of, with a lot of help. So, you know, um, here, let me just tell you the basics of the model, then I'll kind of walk through the history. So the basics as we started to develop it was a patient would be assessed, usually in the ED, that's where most admissions come from, could be a clinic, could be the home. Someone's assessed, 
they have an acute medical condition that can't be taken care of in hospital at home. That person needs hospital level care. That person needs a hospital admission. You don't wanna provide this to someone who could leave the ED with a, with a prescription for an antibiotic or leave with advice to increase their dose of oral diuretic. Uh, they meet medical eligibility criteria, social eligibility criteria. They say yes, they're taken home. And then you bring the hospital home to them. Physician elements, nursing care, intravenous medicines and fluids, oxygen and respiratory therapies, basic radiography, ultrasound. Uh, and you take care of them and you do that all at home and then, and then they are discharged, parallel to what would happen, get the kind of care they would get in the hospital, actually hopefully better care than they would get in the hospital. So this is uh, one slide which summarizes about 20 years of work, which I'll roll through fairly quickly. But this was, this was the journey and, and you know, this took a while and I hope it makes things easier for people like people here, like David, who's trying to lead great programs. But we first, going back to 1994, what do you treat and who do you treat? So we did a lot of work with claims data. What are common reasons that older people go to the hospital? What are things that we think we could take care of at home? How do you set admission thresholds? We developed criteria, medical criteria, to choose the right patients, validated those criteria. We did some uh, early studies on patient acceptability, sort of our field of dream study. If we built it, would people actually come and want to do this? And even back in the mid-late 90s, people were saying, yeah, you know, the hospital's not the greatest thing. I'd like to be at home. We did some early pilot studies at Hopkins. So this study took over a year to get through our IRB. High, you know, as you can imagine, the Hopkins IRB stacked with highly brilliant uh, and respected clinicians and researchers who think the hospital is the only place where you can get care. So it took us a long time to get through the IRB, but we were able to show that yes, people's heads did not explode when they got their acute care uh, at home. We then had some early experience with CMS. So you may not know, but CMS is actually located in Baltimore, about 20 minutes from where, where our hospital is, you could drive down. And in the old days, you did not have to go through maximum security prison kind of security, you park your car, you walk right in, and you get meetings with people. It's actually pretty easy. And CMS, it's interesting, their position 20 years ago is almost similar to what it is now. This is really nice, this is really good, we would like to do this, but we do not, we're not gonna give you a waiver to do this in fee-for-service Medicare. So just the economics of this. So many of you know, you have Medicare, social, uh, medical insurance for people over the age of 65. About 70% of that is fee-for-service person gets admitted to the hospital. There's a payment mechanism for that based on the diagnosis and the severity. Hospital gets paid for that. The reason that bill is able to be generated is because there are rules and regs that allow that. There is no payment mechanism for hospital at home in fee-for-service Medicare. So when I go to the president of Hopkins Hospital, who actually supported our pilot studies, and I say, okay, Ron, we had a great pilot study better clinical outcomes, lower costs. And yes, if you take this person out of your emergency department and, and send them home with me, you're not gonna get paid for that. And that's when they say, how did you ever get promoted around here? Uh, but remember the other 30% of Medicare is managed care, where if you can align, you know, where the economic incentives are better aligned. Right, it's essentially a global budget. If you can do better care for less money in theory, people should line up to do it. So we put out, in terms of doing a bigger study, we put out an RFP to Medicare Managed Care. We got a bunch of them to do a national demonstration study with us, which I'll tell you about in a moment. And then since about 2005 or so, we've been working on dissemination activities. Most recently, a Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation demonstration that concluded last year. So let me bring you through some of that. So these are the high level results from our demonstration, so our early demonstration study in Medicare managed care and a VA medical center. So this is, these were three Medicare managed care plans in Buffalo and also Worcester, Worcester Mass. So the Fallon Community Health Plan, they were great. Uh, and the VA medical center in Portland, Portland, Oregon. And you may say, why the VA? Well, the VA is globally budgeted. You know, it's, it's a great, Despite what you hear in the headlines, it really is a damn good system. 
And you can, I think you can make an argument that at some level, the VA invented geriatric health service delivery. In any event, um, with those plans uh, and the VA, here's what we found. We found that 61% of folks opted in for hospital at home in the context of research. When this is running as a program and not research, that number goes up quite a bit. But imagine now you're an 80 year old person in the ED with pneumonia and someone comes up to you and says, hey, 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 Bruce, how would you like, you're, you have pneumonia, you're supposed to go upstairs. How would you like to be taken care of by people you've never met in a model you've never heard of being sponsored by your friendly neighborhood managed care organization? And by the way, some, some folks from Hopkins wanna do research on you. Please sign this 10 page single space consent form. Even then, right, and even then, even then 61% of folks opted in. And what we found was high quality care by any quality measure, fewer complications. So we had a 75% reduction in incident delirium, right? And Sharon Inouye from, also from Harvard helped us with that. And actually I think there was an NPR story this morning, Wes Ely from Vanderbilt, who's an ICU guy talking about, you know, the long-term cognitive effects of developing delirium in the ICU. Right, so delirium is important because there probably are long-term cognitive effects from that. Um, but lower rates of sedative medication use, lower mortality, better patient and caregiver experience, lower costs of care, less caregiver stress. And you wouldn't believe, actually you guys probably would believe how stressful it is, how much stress is contributed to caregivers' lives by having to park at places like this. That is a real issue. That is not a joke. That is a real damn issue. Uh, better functional outcomes and also high provider satisfaction in our studies. Our study, I think, fits into the world literature on this. There have been several meta-analyses, uh, Cochrane meta-analyses. This is a meta-analysis from Gideon Kaplan, who, who does the stuff down under in, in Sydney. Uh, and there are dozens of randomized controlled trials of hospital at home of various types. And what you find when you put them together is a 21% reduction in mortality, okay? dead or alive at six months. That's a number needed to treat a 50, right? If this were a drug, I would not be standing here. I would be in the Caymans or in Geneva counting my money. This would be a, you know, if you had a pill that did this, that would be the blockbuster drug of all time or one of them for sure. Also reductions in readmissions, but you know, disseminating health service is much different than disseminating a device or a drug. So what Walter think, he definitely wouldn't, would have ended up on a breathing machine uh, if he had been in the hospital. He loved the attention from the nurses because Walter was that kind of guy. And you, you see his cat there, he, he didn't have to worry about his cat. And also our fellows were very thankful because whenever Walter got admitted, I would make the fellow take his cat home. So, <laughs> so uh, this is, this is, Hopkins Hospital, this is the original Hopkins Hospital building, and that is the dome, our dome. <laughs> it's not an ether dome, but it is a dome. That is our corporate symbol, the dome. What's your, do you guys have like a, you just have the, sh the shield? You, you have the, sh the shield, okay, so we, we have a dome. But that dome is where Osler wrote his famous textbook of medicine in the 19th century. And I don't know if you've ever looked through it, but you know, the real contribution of Osler was basically to say, we don't know anything. And let's start to look at things in a systematic way. In any event, the only reason I show this is that we really wanna get out of the ivory tower and push hospital at home into practice. And so we've been doing that for longer than I care to think right now. And how we've done that is to work to create awareness uh, and create interest in the model. So I've learned, earned a lot of frequent flyer miles, giving talks like this, educating systems. I've taken literally hundreds of calls from systems and I will talk to anyone because that's part of my function is to proselytize and educate, not proselytize, but to present the evidence and, and the rationale for this. We've worked to disseminate the model, uh, initially mostly in the VA and within Medicare managed care. So now there are about a dozen or so VA programs around the country, and they're getting more interested in that. We've had some adoptions in Medicare managed care. I'll talk about Presbyterian health systems in a moment, but also the Kaiser system. United Healthcare is getting interested in this. Uh, we've provided technical assistance to several systems that have wanted that to help them get their model off the ground. We've also been doing a lot of work on payment and policy issues. 
So um, these are data that we published in Health Affairs from Presbyterian Health Systems. And the early sweet spot, still a strong sweet spot for hospital at homes, are integrated delivery systems. So Presbyterian out in Albuquerque, New Mexico, main hospital in Albuquerque, so integrated. They own their hospital, they own their providers, their docs are mostly employed docs. They have a Medicare Advantage plan, a Medicare managed care plan that they are the insurers. So if they can take the people that they insure, pay for their hospital care at a lower price because it's provided at home, and open up a hospital bed because they were at capacity, and here's the slightly perverse incentive, you open up a bed, you're paying less for the patient that's your insuree, now you open up a bed and you could take care of someone, someone who's insured by someone else and charge in full freight. That's slick, right? That's a nice one. That's a twofer, right? So they've been running their program now for over 10 years. This is some of their early experience. They had an acceptance rate of 93%. They didn't present it as research. This is what we do. We're going to take you home. We're going to, we're going to do that. Length of stay was shorter, mortality was lower. This, these are the comparison here are administrative data for a, a reasonably matched control group and the patient experience was better. The, the reason I bring this up is because also within an integrated system, you can start to, once you have this tool in your toolkit as a system, you could start to do some cool stuff with it. So you can start to link this to your CHF clinics and your COPD clinics and your palliative medicine clinics. You can start to do all sorts of cool stuff. The other interesting thing is they did not have a home-based primary care program before this. Usually, home -based, usually hospital at home is built on a substrate of home-based primary care. They didn't have it. When they started doing hospital at home, they realized they needed it, and then they developed one. Then they developed one. <clears throat> so these are some dots on the map now of hospital at home programs that are going on. So we have some dots on the map, which is really very good. And in future work, um, David Levine and I are with uh, a hope for a grant from the Hartford Foundation are going to try and create a national users group of hospital at home programs, try and develop some standards, understand what's being done in the field. And then in terms of that payment and policy work, um, uh, we did a uh, CMMI demonstration project at Mount Sinai in New York. Uh, so this, we, this demo ended about a year ago. And under this demo, you had to propose to CMS an innovative model and an innovative payment mechanism. So what we proposed was, you know, when, when we started on hospital at home in the 90s, no one was thinking about 30-day readmissions. Transitions of care hadn't really been born yet. And we thought of hospital at home as that acute admission. But the world changed, and, and we wanted to recognize this. So we proposed to CMS, let's do acute hospital at home, and then do 30 days of post-acute care, kind of a transition model. It'll be a little less intense in the acute, but we'll do that. And what we proposed as a payment was a 30-day bundled payment. Bundled payments were something no one was really thinking of except in the context of the acute DRG, but that was also what we did. And we also got a grant from the Hartford Foundation to do an evaluation of the CMMI demo because they have a, a habit of having those evaluations taking a very long time. Um, and these were our data that we published recently in JAMA Internal Medicine, so hospital at home and a control group, not a randomized control trial, as many CMMI demos are not but good, a good matched group. And what you find very consistent with our prior studies, lower lengths of stay, readmission rates cut by more than half, ED visits cut by more than half, low rates of transfer to SNF, slightly higher rate of referrals to skilled home healthcare, which you would expect, better caregiver experience and lower costs. So the other key learning to come out of this demonstration was the fact that once you've developed this hospital at home, to think of it as a widget, think of it as a tool, you can start to do some pretty cool things with it. And this was born out of necessity. When we put in our CMMI demo, uh, Sinai Hospital did not have an OBS unit, an observation unit. And they developed one just as we were starting. And a lot of the patients who probably would have come to hospital at home went to the OBS unit and then got admitted to Sinai when they stayed past their two midnights. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We said, hey, we can do an OBS unit at home. If someone stays two midnights at home, we can convert them 
to an admission. And then other things started to kind of float in. So we started, we developed acute palliative care at home. So these were people who came to the ED. They were essentially hospice patients, but no one had ever told them, right? And they come to the hospital with pneumonia. We would take them home and then start to have those end of life discussions with them and enroll them in hospice. Got to get some good outcomes. We developed what we call hospital averse at home. People would come to the ED. They'd be told they need to be admitted. They actually might be too sick for our criteria, but they would absolutely refuse to go to the hospital. I am the caretaker for my wife with Alzheimer's. I can't be in the hospital. We, we would take care of them at home. Sine is starting pediatrics hospital at home. And then the real cool one was rehab at home. So like no one wants to go to a sniff. No one, anyone here want to go to a sniff? No one wants to go to a sniff. So we started doing, you know, people who were in the hospital, completed their hospital course, slated to go to a skilled nursing facility for post acute care. If they had a, what was going to be a therapy focused sniff admission, take them home. 98% of people offered that, took that up. So how do we mainstream um, home-based medical care? I'm going to focus mostly on hospital at home for time's sake, and I think I'm running over anyway. Um, so if you think about diffusion of innovations, many theories out there, here's one, Everett Rogers, great book, talked about Iowa farmers. It's really, it's really a lovely story. But he talked about five attributes of innovations that hinder or help dissemination and diffusion. So relative advantage, is your, is your widget better than the current widget? And I think there are reasons to think that hospital at home at some level is some of the data I presented. Is your widget observable? Can people see it so they can kind of get acculturated to it? Hopefully those dots that we're putting on the map will help with that. Um, complexity, hospital at home is a complex thing. And that is a hard thing and that needs to be worked on. Can you try it out easily? Not the easiest thing just to kind of say, hey, let's, Let's wing this for a few weeks and see how we like it. And then, but I think the real big one is compatibility, which really speaks uh, to culture. <clears throat> so I'm a little short on time. So I'm going to do I would, there are two stories here. I'm going to talk about one story. So I'm going to talk about the backwards bicycle, which may be a, a good one for, for academic medical centers. Not this one, but, but, but others, but others. So, um, Go on YouTube later and just put into the search engine backward bicycle. This is a, like a four minute video, but I'm going to give you the, the essence of it. A guy had some, had some engineers build him a bicycle that did the opposite. So you turn the handlebars to the right, the wheel actually goes to the left. And you're all thinking, all of you are thinking, I can do that. And just like he did, he said, I'll, I'll shimmy the wheel, I'll do this, I'll know, I'll tell my eighth nerve to do something different, whatever it is. And it took him eight months to learn how to ride this bicycle. Then the funny thing is, then he gets on a plane and he goes to Amsterdam. Have you ever been to Amsterdam? Lots of bicycles, lots of bicycles. And he gets on a regular bicycle. And he also falls off. But it only took him about two hours to get back on his bicycle. So he talks about this as a metaphor of, of a few things. One is that some things are just so hardwired. Even if you think you can do something different, you know what? You can't. It's the difference between understanding that I need to change or do something different and knowing how to do it. I think that is a fundamental thing that is going on in healthcare. People understand that we need to do things differently, but they just don't know how to do the thing differently. Which is why, why when big companies want to develop a new product line, they will often create like a pirate group and they will send them away to an isolated island to do their thing. Because when you're in the system, you can't do it. I mean, in our own place, even though it's being recorded, I will say this. So we, are, we have our home-based primary care program. It lives in the division of geriatric medicine where it hasn't made money for anyone in a very long time. But it does save money. It saves money for Medicare. So we've been making the argument for the last few years, let us move this division program to the health system where it will save money. That process has taken scores of meetings 
And the real interesting thing is it's like these little things that are hardwired into the system that trip you up, like the financial analysts Excel sheet that gets presented to leadership, like for years did not have a place for projected savings. You know, our heads wanted to explode. In any event, this notion of just because you understand you need to change doesn't mean you can change. And I think again, within systems, geriatricians have to lead that charge to make that, to make that happen. Um, the other huge challenge in terms of, of hospital at home, this gets to that complexity, is are what I would call supply chain challenges. So anyone know where this picture was taken? Times Square, Times Square, New York. Um, I think I know the day this was taken. In any event, I, I, any of you have lived in New York? <clears throat> right, you live in New York, no one cooks. You get on the phone, you, it's still easier to get Chinese food delivered at two o'clock in the morning through a blizzard in New York than it is to get oxygen delivered at 12 noon on a sunny day. So all of those supply chain logistics kind of things that make hospital at home difficult must be solved. That is gonna take a lot of capital to build those systems out. To get this thing to really fly, it has to become, someone's gonna to have to invest probably hundreds of millions of dollars to develop some sort of cookie cutter supply chain, right? We have a supply chain for the hospital, right? In the ORs here, if someone orders real anesthesia, it's up there in two minutes. You're doing home based you're doing skilled home health care. That has its own supply chain. It operates at a very different tempo, but they have a supply chain. Right. David has had to create the supply chain for hospital at home here in Boston. That is not an easy thing to do and to make it safe and redundant and hardened. That's a really important thing. Uh, you need payment. So um, this is a picture of me and Linda DeCherry from Sinai and Al Su from Mount Sinai. They were the leaders uh, of the development there. And we spent the summer of 2017 putting together a proposal for the PTAC the Physician-Focused Payment Model Technical Advisory Committee to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. I did that all in one breath, I want you to know. But under MACRA, the Medicare and CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015, the PTAC was created. Anyone could submit a proposal for a new kind of payment model in Medicare. And this was supposed to be a really good thing. We wrote our proposal, we submitted it. Last September, ours was the first proposal for that bundled payment that was approved unanimously by the PTAC. That went to the secretary. That was Tom Price. Tom Price was soon gone after taking a lot of first class flights. And then there was a long delay and then Secretary Azar assumed the chair. And by then several PTAC proposals had made it to his desk. And then about two or three months ago, he basically, basically said no to all of them. And part of that, it's difficult to understand exactly all of that. And, and, and I can talk about that with you guys offline. But to say the one thing is our rejection letter was probably one of the nicer ones because he at least directed CMMI to talk with us about hospital at home. And, geez, and we've had some meetings there. And, uh, uh, and I think they are interested, CMS is interested in promoting models that can be done under current authority, perhaps with some waivers, but it's unclear. But they are at least seeking advice. So I think there's some, some reason to be hopeful. Um, this was a full page ad in the New York Times that Sinai started to put out in 2015. If our beds are filled, it means we've failed. And I would say, and I think people at Sinai would say when this first came out, this was marketing, but it was great. It was great to see, I mean, my God, to see that in the New York Times, that was fantastic. Um, but over the years, Sinai leadership has really gotten invested in home-based care. So they recently started a home-based medical care service line. That's really cool. They recently tore down, I don't know if any of you have been to New York, there used to be the Beth Israel Hospital in the low 20s around 2nd or 3rd Avenue. That used to be a 900 bed hospital. Torn down, replaced with a three or 400 bed hospital. And hospital at home is one of several strategies that Sinai is using to keep people out of the hospital. So when leadership does get their heads straight, this can happen. Um, and also there are international examples where this is scaled. So in 
Victoria State, Australia, where this great city of Melbourne is, the health authority in the mid 90s said, you know what, we're going to reimburse hospital at home at exactly the same price that we pay for hospital care. And so a thousand little flowers bloomed. You know, when you, you know, money is the answer. What's the question, right? You know, they, they put the money out there and things started to happen to the point now where when it was last reported, somewhere in the neighborhood of five to six percent of all hospital days in Victoria State are hospital at home days. And had they not done that, they say they would have had to have built another 500 bed hospital. Do you know what it costs to capitalize a hospital bed? Anyone? $2 million or so. That's a billion dollars. That is societal return on investment when you don't have to spend a billion dollars to build a hospital. Any event, you know, I wouldn't be, I, I wouldn't uh, be able to carry my health services research card if I didn't say more research was needed on a host of issues for hospital at home. And I really do believe that this will ultimately get mainstreamed into US healthcare. It will take a while. It will take a lot of people working in a lot of ways, both on the academic side, on the industry side, on the regulatory side, on the payment side. But I think this will happen. It's, I think it's too important for it not to happen. I'm all yours. Fantastic, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you. I'll open it up for questions and maybe I'll start. I'm curious to learn a little bit more about the acute palliative care at home team and what your experience has been transitioning patients to hospice, particularly if it's led to longer hospice missions. Yeah, so, you know, the folks who would come into the uh, acute palliative care at home stream at Sinai, they tended to be, you know, folks with palliative care diagnoses, like cancer diagnoses, like end-stage heart failure diagnoses, end-stage COPD diagnoses. And it just felt like people hadn't had those conversations. And I would say one thing I, I should have mentioned, I usually do, but I forgot, is that one thing about providing care in the home, which is very powerful for me, is that when you're at home, the power structure of medicine is completely turned on its head, right? So the ability to have those conversations with someone in their living room, at their kitchen table, as an equal, instead of standing at the, you know, the head of the bed in your suit or your white coat as the power, that changes everything. I mean, I will admit that uh, when I, I attend in the hospital uh, on the medicine service, and I will say there are times where I'm not incredibly proud of my behavior, but I, and I, when I do those things, I, I like I kick myself in the head, but I know that I would never do them when I'm on a, uh, a house call. I would just never, it's impossible. You can never say, excuse me, I'll be back in a moment with no intention of going back. All of us have done that at least once in our <laughs> life. Okay, I, am not, I am not alone, but that is an impossible thing to do on a house call. You're a guest, you act different, it changes your mindset. And I think when it, it engenders a level of trust that allows those end of life conversations to happen better, right? I mean, there is a, a growing, an early but growing evidence base for home-based palliative care outside of the hospital at home space, still early. Um, but I think, you know, it's interesting. Some things need evidence to spread and other things don't. And a lot of times when people are saying more evidence, more evidence, more evidence, a little bit of that is smokescreen, <laughs> I think. Right, so many of you know Diane Meyer, brilliant, wonderful geriatrician and palliative medicine physician at Mount Sinai. Her insight, the insight I think that she won the MacArthur Genius Award for wasn't really palliative care, the noun. It was the verb on dissemination. And her insight was, it's not a lack of evidence that is preventing palliative medicine from getting out into the, into the medical world, but it's a lack of know-how, it's a lack of the ability to implement. So all of her work to push out palliative medicine was really about developing technical assistance assets. It wasn't about doing randomized trials, those came later. But she, had, she started with a narrative, pushed out, and then they got the evidence. So some things need evidence, some things don't. I don't think home-based palliative care is gonna need evidence. That's just gonna go because the economics of that are so strong and the logistics of it are log order easier than other things, right? Thank you. Other questions? Hi, thank you for your talk. 
Um, you mentioned that the points of entry to a home, hospital at home program are usually either the ED, the main one, or at a clinic, or sometimes at home. Has it ever uh, been uh, tried or a model in which a patient is admitted already to the hospital and then maybe one or two days later <clears throat> transferred to a hospital at home? That is a great question. So the question is, has anyone tried sort of something of a hybrid model? Put, put someone on the quote unquote inpatient side for a day and then take them home. That is um, an idea that people are working on. And some of the challenges of that are related to, you know, when or do you trigger a DRG in that? So, you know, it's, this goes back to Woodward and Bernstein, right? Follow the money. So, you know, inform follows function a bit. So in say a managed care context, where again, you have a little bit more freedom to spread your elbows a bit, that is a model that I think will come. The interesting challenge that I think will happen there is um, will you be able to extricate someone from that hospital bed the next day? I mean, at some level, that's the OBS unit construct, right? So someone say they're in OBS for 24 hours. You're saying, okay, they really do need a hospital admission. Now we're going to take you home. I, I'm, I don't know what that uptake rate will be. I can guess, I'd be curious to hear what David thinks that uptake rate will be. But I think that once people get comfortable, <laughs> sometimes they don't wanna move. I, I, um, so I think the way you do that could be very interesting. So if I were gonna do it, I would create a place within the hospital that didn't look anything like a hospital. I would create like a gorgeous, hotel roomy kind of thing that matched, not, maybe not gorgeous hotel room. I, I would go for more of a hotel room kind of, con something that looked like home as opposed to a hospital. So that someone might want it, hey, would you like to go now to your home? You really haven't, you've been in the hospital, but you know, it's been home. So let's just now go home. I don't know. I, I think that's gonna be a really interesting experiment. And, and I think it's a great idea. I think that's something that will happen. It may cause CFO's heads to explode, but that never bothered me too much. I want to open it up for any questions from our remote sites. Or maybe one final question here. Hey, Bruce. Hey, thanks so much again. Um, so this being, this is a um, grand rounds for uh, pal care and geriatric medicine. Um, I also see kind of this challenge with geriatrics being mainstream. And if you could maybe just speak about like how you see the interplay between geriatric medicine and, you know, main, mainstreaming these innovative home-based programs. Oh my God, how much time do we have? <laughs> it is really interesting. Geriatrics has had a lot of trouble getting mainstreamed. I think much, more difficult than palliative medicine being mainstream. And, and that is something that has always been so interesting to me on so many levels. It's interesting, I think, also if you look at international examples, right? So in the UK, in Ireland, what's the most popular specialty? Geriatrics. And I think partly that's because those cultures are, they live a little bit more in a primary care world. Uh, I think there's a cultural issue where older people are valued in, by the society and by the culture. Um, and I think it's probably easier to make a decision to go into, you know, when you're in the UK, remember the consultant geriatrician who's at the top of the food chain and the consultant neurosurgeon make exactly the same salary. You know, geriatrics is one it's like the one field where when you do a fellowship, your, your, your income goes down, right? So I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I had the geriatric medicine board at ABIM. So geriatric medicine is the one and only internal medicine subspecialty, the one and only where diplomates maintain their internal medicine certificate at rates higher than their geriatric medicine certificate. We need to do things 
on the training front. And I am all ears. I will listen to anyone who has ideas on that. And we're, we're working on some things now with the board for that. But I think, you know, I was, we, we have this wonderful woman who joined our group from Ireland, whose husband is an oncologist now at Hopkins. And so I talk to her about this all the time. She says, you know what, at every step of the way in our medical school and in our training program, we are exposed to geriatrics all the time. I think a lot of it's exposure, it's economics, it's culture. Let's all work on that. With that, we'll end. Thank you so much, Thank Dr. Thank you so Lapp. much.